to worship our Lord here this morning, and we are excited to do that. It's starting to be like fall, and it's time for the seasons to change. But in those changing seasons, there is God still working on us, with us, and through us. So I invite you, if you would, to stand on your feet, because we want to begin our worship time praising the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair Bow down with care, God gave His Son to win. His erring child, He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. Could we with oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above Drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. time of desperation when all around is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe in this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see There is only one salvation We believe, we believe We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit And he's coming back We believe 
So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations We believe, we believe Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back. Let the lost be found, and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud, our God will save. We believe, we believe, and the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has won the veil, now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back, He's coming back again. Salvador, which is the smallest country in Central America, but to me is the most beautiful one. El Salvador had humble, kind, and very hardworking people. I grew up with a single mother who was a hardworking woman and did her best to support me. Sometimes she had to leave me with my grandparents and my aunts to be able to go to work. Because of the distance of where she worked, I only see her once a month. I was her only child. I didn't have any siblings. I often felt lonely. I struggled so much when I was a little kid in kindergarten. I didn't finish kindergarten because I was so sick with bronchitis and I missed a lot of days from the school. I didn't like to go to the school, but there was a very special place where I love to go. And that special place was church. Close to my grandparents' house, there was a small, tiny church. I remember they were giving Sunday school classes, so I asked for permission to go. Sunday mornings, I ran to the class to hear what the pastor was going to teach. And I enjoy learning more and more about God. At the end of the three months of Sunday school classes, we were told that we were going to have a celebration and maybe we were going to have a gift. When we walked into church, there were big cardboard boxes and inside were these beautiful red and green boxes. We start being called one by one, Nate by Nate. When I walked to the front and I received my two box, I was very curious to know what was inside the two box. When I opened the two box, I remember this fresh, clean, and sweet smell of the two box. There were so many things, not just one item, but so many items that were for me. There was two favorite items, Slinky and a journal. That journal was so special to me because I didn't have anything similar to that. I didn't even want to use it at all. That shoebox brought me joy, gladness, 
and reassurance of God's love that even though my mom was not able to be there with me all the time and my dad was not there, God was always there with me, taking good care of me and he was always present and always going to be present. What's beautiful. I want to thank you all for packing two boxes and bringing hope to children around the world. May the Almighty God bless each of you. This is our day for our in-gathering, for our shoeboxes, for Operation Christmas Child. I want to remind you, you may be thinking, oh, man, I forgot. Oh, I've got one at home. Well, bring it during the week, and we will make sure that it's counted and, and, and put in because we are one of the collection drop-off sites in the region uh, all week long. But then you may be thinking, I never did get one together but I want to. Well, let me tell you, go online, SamaritansPurse.org. Go on to there. You can, you can find a way in which you can purchase a box right there online with your credit card or your debit card, and you can, you can purchase a box. And what that will do, it's an angel kind of event where you are absolutely not only helping then, you're helping immediately because shipping has tripled, quadrupled. Uh, in uh, in in the recent days, you know, there's going to be a, a big cost for shipping the boxes over. But if you go online to create a box, what they will do is they'll be able to wire that money to the missionary that's working with them, where they are, and they will assemble a box that's appropriate for the kids in the region in which they minister. And by doing that, you know, you're kind of cutting out all of that shipping cost that we have. So. If you have brought your box and you are ready to bring that up, we are going to do that right now. If not, remember to go online, or if you've got a box waiting at home you just forgot, bring it during the week, or are we going to take them next Sunday, Kathy, if they bring them? Okay, so we'll, if you bring it next Sunday, that will work as well. As Robbie plays, if you have your box, would you please come bring it to our OCC table over here right now? Playing, there may be some who assemble their box right now. <laughs> yes, everybody's gone to their phone to plug in right now, so that's good too. Um, understand that. Our text here uh, for today uh, is from 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning with verse 4 and into verse 20. Now, when the day came when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Benia his wife, and to all her sons, and all her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, because he loved Hannah. But the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. And so Hannah wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat, and why is your heart so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. So it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. 
As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought her drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I'm a woman oppressed in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maid servant as a worthless woman, for I've spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, well, then go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. And she said, well, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due time, after Hannah had conceived, that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Lord God, we petition you over many things, Heavenly Father. But are we as persistent as someone like Hannah? Are we trusting enough, Lord, in you to create a future hope and a hope for the future? Lord, be with us as we worship you now. And may you open up our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds that we may discover a message from your word for our living today. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I invite you, if you would, to rise again and to worship with us in song here this morning. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain there is a faith proved of more worth than gold so refine me lord through the flame i will bring praise i will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall remain i will rejoice i will declare god is my victory in me this is my prayer in the battle when triumph is still on its way i am a conqueror and co-heir with christ so firm on his promise i'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God is my victory and He is here All of my life, in every season You are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship All of my life In every season You are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship All of my life 
in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship I will bring praise I will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and He is here. This is my prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received I will sow. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. He is Lord. alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all when he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Time for our children's moment. 
if any of our young people want to join me for children's moment, does Nicholas want to come with me? <laughs> does Nicholas want to come over here? Tim, you, you, you're good where you're at, Sit. <laughs> no? Doesn't want to come to Uncle Mike? Oh, he, he's out of it. Okay, yeah, well, I, a lot of people take a nap about this time in the service. <laughs> right, Talmadge? Uh. <laughs> Our story is that of an older woman who is childless, and therefore in that time and place and society and history, is futureless. You ever noticed how many Old Testament stories are like that? <laughs> you know, they begin that way. It's a story about a woman who is one of two wives to one husband, Elkanah. And Elkanah of Ephraim had these wives, Hannah, we talked about. She was barren, considered a curse from God, and culturally shamed a lot. For lack of son would mean widows in, pover, in poverty because there would be no one to take care of them. Hannah, the wife that it seems Elkanah loved the most, was taunted by her more fertile co-wife, uh, uh, Pitya. And Elkanah loved Hannah. And he may have been trying to speak caringly to her in these things, but sometimes you wonder how wise are his words. Hannah turned away from food because she was hurting so bad emotionally. She would weep with bitter tears at anything. And she constantly prayed. She vowed that if the Lord would let her bear a son, she would dedicate that child for life to the Lord. And her praying was vocal. So Eli, who was the high head priest of the temple in Shiloh, uh, basically thought Hannah, because she was moving her mouth but not saying her prayer, was drunk. Have you ever noticed how many times that happens when God is working with someone in the Scriptures? And yet, she basically protests to Eli she says, look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not drunk, as you suppose. I'm praying out of desperation. And Eli was like, well, okay, I understand that. And he offered her a blessing instead of, of uh, rousing her out of the temple. And with that blessing, Hannah gave up her fast, and her depression seemed to lift. And after she returned home, she and her husband were together, and the Lord remembered her. I, I talked yesterday at the funeral of Jean Grey, and I talked about remembering. How often in the scriptures you see the word remember come up? Noah is in a boat on water, and everything is covered with water, and the scripture says, and God remembered Noah. Yeah. When you look at the New Testament, you see that Jesus is being crucified on a cross and a person suffering the same exact fate and pain next to him looks and says, remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Remembering is a powerful thing. And here Hannah just needed to know that God remembered her. And so soon after, she bore a son, and she would name that son Samuel. And we learn that God would later bless Hannah again and again, three more sons and two daughters. So evidently, you know, once one, the rest came. It's one thing for Hannah to be gifted a son of God here, but the real kicker is what she does with the child. After praying for a child, wanting a child, needing a child in her life, most of us would say, what? Well, I'm going to keep that child right beside me the whole time. Not going to let him out of my sight. But knowing full well that her social security is tied up into her son <laughs> in not too many years from now, 
She keeps her promise she'd made all that infertile time of her life that she would give her son back to God. That was God's claim on Samuel and Hannah's gift back to God for blessing her. William Willimon, when he taught religion classes at uh, the seminary at Duke University, was teaching a course called Introduction to the Ordained Ministry. Every year he would give an assignment that would, he, all he wanted was a couple of pages from the student. And each one of them were to write his or her autobiography entitled, My Life with God. He told, he told them, I want you to just explain, how does God help to explain your life? Tell me how God accounts for who you are. In the story that he wrote in one of his books, he said, I loved reading those papers. Most uh, of us are skilled in explaining ourselves on the basis of ourselves. We're pretty good about telling about our desires, our efforts, our choices, but Scripture attempts to teach us to narrate our lives as part of God's work with us, interpreting ourselves not like we want or we desire or we see ourselves, but as God desires us to be. He said the best paper in the bunch was the one that began one day. I was a teenager from, we'll edit that word, I made my parents' lives miserable. So they weren't surprised when only after one year I flunked out of the University of Texas, drinking and partying my way into oblivion. I knew I was in for a treat of an autobiography, Williman said, when I began reading that. To be honest, he said, I wasn't disappointed. The, the young man wrote on, he said, I hung around Austin for a while and strangely found myself getting involved in a nearby United Methodist Church. He said, I thought I was rebelling against the church, but I, I came to love this church and adored the pastor and found myself getting more and more involved. And then one Sunday afternoon, I drove back to my little town in Texas to tell my parents the astounding news that I was going to go back to school and that I was going back to school to become a Methodist preacher. When I sat my parents down, he wrote, and told them the incredible news, I was shocked. My mother immediately broke down into tears, and she said, I am so embarrassed. I am so ashamed. Embarrassed? Ashamed? I mean, what did my mother mean, he said. Then she spoke. She said, do you remember I had two miscarriages before I was pregnant with you? And when I became pregnant with you, I prayed to God that if he would only help me bring this baby to term, I would dedicate him to the Lord. And I would call his name Samuel, just like in the Bible story. The young man wrote and said, so I told her, you did what? You sure could have saved me a lot of trouble if you told me that story from the beginning <laughs> and I wouldn't have gone off trying to find my purpose. I didn't know it would work, she told him. After all, we're Methodists. We don't take that stuff seriously. <laughs> I'm relating that story because you need to be warned just in case you think you're hearing these ancient stories that still can't happen to people like Hannah and children like Samuel, God continues to give people unimaginable gifts. Sometimes it's a child in our old age, like with Hannah, but most of all, God is still giving out hope for our future. By Hannah giving this gift, God gave her a future she would have thought impossible. Think about it. In Mark chapter 13, which is our other reading for today, it is that chapter that is often referred to by Bible scholars as the little apocalypse from Jesus. It begins this way in the first eight verses. As Jesus was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings around us. Jesus said, You see these? Great buildings? 
Not one stone is going to be left on top of the other, which will be torn down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. He said, tell us, when will these things be? What will the sign be? When will all these things going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say this to them. See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name and saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be frightened. Do not be frightened. Those things take place, but that is not yet the end. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Jesus tells us signs are great, but it's just the beginning. You have to wait upon God. You have to wait upon God. And when the disciples say, give us more, tell us more, tell us more, in that text and in that story, Jesus looks at them and says, my interpretation. You're on a need-to-know basis. Right now you don't need to know anything more than what I've told you. I hate that. Don't you? I hate it. When I'm on a need-to-know basis, and I just, uh, you know, but I've, I've found a lot of peace in my life that way. My mom once accused me. She asked me stuff about the kids or uh, uh, Sarah or Sean or Susan or whatever, and she would ask about something that was coming up, and I said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Didn't you ask her? Didn't you? I said, no. They're adults now. I figure I'm on a need-to-know basis, and I'm not curious enough to buck that. <laughs> She goes, you're not, you're not inquisitive, you don't care. I said, I didn't say I didn't care. I just said, I'm not obsessed with having to know everything. I'm going to be the perfect father of the bride by not having to know what's happening with the wedding. <laughs> if anyone needed that message from Jesus, though, it was the community of faith that Mark was writing to. See, Mark is writing around 70 A.D., and the community of faith that they have all grown from and out of in Jerusalem is being torn apart by the Romans. As he penned the very good news of Jesus, and all looked bleak and all looked black for believers, for the church, for people everywhere. But Mark was reminding them, reminding us all these thousands of years later that we serve a patient God who works on God's time and not our time. Now that's something Hannah held. And if you think about it last week, the previous book in the Bible, Ruth received the same trust. And that is the very thing we lack. Oh, sorely do we lack in your life and mine today. Patience. Patience. Though, you know, I, I, I briefly scanned headlines today and I saw where somebody wrote some article uh, for the area, and I thought it very profound. You know, we've had four bus crashes in the area in the last 10 days or more. And every one of them, is kind of summed up about impatience, not paying attention to what's going on around us, not noticing what's happening, who we're beside, where our vehicle is nearby. Patience. Yeah. Yesterday, I was in the funeral procession for Jean Grey, and we made our way to the Ridgeway Cemetery, and... We, had to, we got out off of Reeves Road and went down 220 Business, and we're heading out. And by the time we got to where we turned on the road towards Eden, you know, 1487 there, uh, and we were going to make a right onto uh, the, the street, what I call Main Street and Ridgeway. <laughs> what? Church Street. Might as well be Main Street, as big as Ridgeway is. But... You know, we turn right onto that road, and 
I noticed when we turned onto the road to Eden, suddenly there's a car behind me that wasn't there <laughs> in the procession this whole time. In fact, didn't have the lights on, did, and I recognize this ain't, this ain't part of the procession. And we get up to the intersection, the police officers stop there so traffic will stop and we could turn right and we won't need any more police escort. And I thought, this is going to be good. You know, here comes the lead car, here comes, you know, Libby in her car, here's me behind her, the, the ministers, and then there's this woman in her in her van with, a, I think, a couple of kids in there, and the procession, and I thought, this is going to be good. I wonder how she's going to do this, because I'm sure she wants to go that way. And so she pulls right and follows us, and then immediately turns into Ridgeway Baptist to find her way out. And I thought, patience. Patience. The Bible even says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Waiting. Reshape is about waiting and it's about process. You don't just wake up one morning and decide to lose weight and you lose it all that week. It just doesn't happen that way. It's a process. You don't immediately pray for a child. And then get one right away. You don't immediately say, I know the direction. And I'm immediately going to go in that direction. And I will immediately get there. Lisa, would you? Thank you. It's a journey. And when you are patient on the journey, God seems to show up in unbelievable ways, through unbelievable people to remind us how long-lasting is the works of God. And the Lord remembered her, the Scripture tells us in verse 19. And it came about in due time that Hannah conceived, gave birth to a son, named him Samuel, because I asked for him. Sometimes we can't see how imparting our prayers are just the beginning of something far beyond that moment of grace. Fred Craddock, pastor extreme, teacher at uh, Chandler, Chandler University in uh, Chandler School of Theology in Atlanta, was professor there at this time in his life, associated with Emory University. He and his wife needed a vacation, they needed a break, they needed to get out. So they went to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they rented a quaint little cabin beside a mountain stream. On the first night, the very first night of their getaway from the world and everybody else, the Craddocks visited one of those small mom-and-pop type restaurants. It was not a fancy place. It featured wooden chairs and tables, plaid tablecloths, but excellent cooking. As they waited for their meal to be served, they noticed an old man enter the restaurant. Wearing overalls, he looked the part of a mountaineer. He went around the room, moving from one table to another, greeting the guests at each table, and Fred Craddock had that immediate thought, we have come to Gatlinburg to get away from people. And I'll bet this old man is going to bother us. Sure enough, the old man makes his way to their table. Hi, folks, where are you from? Well, we're from Atlanta, Dr. Craddock told him. What are you doing in Atlanta? Craddock knew immediately when he said the truth, this is going to be a long conversation. Hoping to put him off, he simply said, I'm a professor of homiletics. That usually gets them to go, oh, oh, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> oh, he said, you teach preachers how to preach. Oh, he knows what I do. <laughs> Craddock a little confounded. The old man knew what the word homiletics meant. So with that, the old man pulled up a chair, sat down at the table with Dr. and Mrs. Craddock. He said, I have a preacher story to tell you. Don't they all, he thought. Probably heard this already 50 times. Well, the old man started spinning his tail. He said, I was born and raised right here in the mountains of East Tennessee. You know, I never knew who my father was. 
My mother gave me her name, not my father's name, because she didn't want me to hold a grudge against him. See, I was born out of wedlock. I was an illegitimate child. Back in those days, that was quite a stigma to live with. I always felt bad about myself. When I was growing up, my classmates at school said some very unkind things to me, and when I went to town on Saturday, I had the feeling people were talking about me behind my back. After I was born, my mother didn't go to church no more. She said she didn't feel welcome. My grandmother knew how important it was for me to attend worship. Every Sunday, she took me to a little Methodist church that was nestled against the hillside, and we would arrive just as the service started so she could avoid answering questions or speaking to anybody. We'd sit, mister, back in that back pew, and when the service was over, we'd leave immediately as soon as we could and scoot right out that door because we didn't want to talk to anybody. I'd listen to the preacher, but I didn't like him very much. He, had, he was a large man, had a big, booming voice, had those big, bushy eyebrows that jumped up and down when he preached. And he shook his finger a lot at you. Always had a feeling he was pointing that finger right at me. That booming voice, that pointing finger were quite intimidating, so I was afraid of him. For 14 years, we've been going to that little church. About this time, Craddock's thinking, oh, my goodness, I am never going to get away from this man. But the man continued. He said, one Sunday, as we started to leave, the usher stopped us at our usual exit time and place. You can't go out this way, he said. We had a winter storm, and ice and snow had covered the steps, so it's not safe. You're going to have to leave by the side door over there. For the first time, I found myself caught up in a line of people headed down front to speak to the preacher. But I didn't want to talk to that preacher. He scared me so much. So I was walking down the aisle, glancing to the left, looking to the right. I saw the door, and there was my opportunity. I'm going to make an escape. And as I started for the exit, I felt this enormous hand touch and grab my shoulder. And I whirled around, and I was staring straight in the face of that bushy eyebrowed big old preacher. He asked me the question that I had dreaded for 14 years. Boy, he said, who's your daddy? Boy, the silence of that moment was deafening. Then the preacher looked at me and said, Oh, now I see, now I see the resemblance. You're a child of God. You go and you claim your inheritance. Fred Craddock suddenly felt cold chills go up and down his spine, and he looked at the old mountaineer and he said, Would you please tell me your name? The old man said, my name's Ben Hooper. Dr. Craddock remembered. He remembered his grandfather telling him the story of an illegitimate boy who grew up in the mountains of East Tennessee, a boy who would come out of that beginning and become an attorney, a boy for whom the people of Tennessee later elected to two terms as their governor. You can look it up. The boy's name was Ben Hooper. God works in all of our lives beyond our prayers of the moment. Samuel was born to more than Elkanah and, and Hannah. He was born a child of God. What is out there, the simple word like, you are a child of God and look just like your daddy will do to a life. These images that you see of OCC do the same exact thing. They tell some children who have no ability to feel any type of confidence in themselves, you look just like a child of God to me. And what that will do to a life, well, it might just make you governor. And what will it do to other lives is the big thing. How many lives become impacted beyond that because somebody tells you you're a child of God? You see, our future hope is only found in trust and patience, just like with Hannah, and waiting upon the Lord. And that story hasn't changed. Our story hasn't changed. I don't know about you, but I'm game. 
No matter how long it takes, I'm, I'm fine with it. Are you? Are you fine enough to trust that God knows what in the world God's doing? Ah, there's the rub, as Shakespeare would say. There's the rub. I invite you to be patient and trust. Like Ruth had done last week, like Hannah had done this week. Like old Fred Craddock learned from Ben Hooper. <laughs> to wait and to trust. Let's bow together. Lord, we wait and we trust you and you alone. Until we can look closer in image of being your child, we will trust your work on us. Until we can be able to, to show and reveal the unbelievable depths and places you will go to reveal your grace, we'll trust you over ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you, if you would, to stand with me right now. Maybe God wants you to make some decision. This is the opportunity to do just that. And I'll be down here for that. As we sing together, remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay here with me. apart from me you can do nothing remain in me now go from this place of worship Leave here living and sharing the good news that our future hope is with God and we will wait as long as God waits. We will follow and be patient on God. Amen.